any conflict. Your fate will depend on your actions. War crimes will be prosecuted. War criminals will be punished. And it will be no defense to say, I was just following orders. I would like to invite the moderator of the sixth session, Professor Ayşe Gül Altınay, please. Thank you very much for your patience. So what we will do, I, I was saying that we, were, we have been zooming into Iraq what we will do in this final session, the sixth session of the World Tribunal on Iraq, is to zoom out and to all together think about the implications, the global implications of this war. My name is Ayşe Gül Altınay. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I teach at Sabancı University here in Istanbul. My work has focused on, as the presentation will show, militarism, nationalism, and gender, more specifically in Turkey, but also um, uh, its more global and theoretical implications. Um, I have a book in English called The Myth of the Military Nation, Militarism, Gender, and Education in Turkey, where I look at the very modern uh, construction of the myth that the Turkish nation is a military nation. What I will do today in this presentation is to talk about militarism and the culture of violence. And I will be zooming in and out of Turkey, Iraq, um, and looking at the past century, trying to look at the past century and to where we stand today. Exactly 100 years ago, in 1905, Leo Tolstoy published his essay, Patriotism and Government, where he said the following. Continental powers, without a murmur, submitted to the introduction of a universal military service, that is, to the slavery, which for the degree of degradation and loss of will cannot be compared with any of the ancient conditions of slavery. Introduced by the French Revolution and perfected by Prussia, Universal military service had turned the formation of citizen armies into a foundational process in the emerging nation states of Europe. A state's soldiers would no longer be limited to its paid mercenaries. With the introduction of military service as a foundation of citizenship, the states would have access to the minds and bodies of at least half of their citizens. This enabled a cheap, an effective form of military mobilization, which soon created the catastrophes of World War I and World War II. I don't know if this was your reaction a minute ago when I read Tolstoy's quote, but when I first read the statement some years ago, um, alerted by one of my professors, Taha Parla, who was here yesterday, um, this quote, calling military service the worst form of slavery in 1905, I was quite surprised. These views are quite radical even today. They must have been, I thought, like science fiction in 1905. How could he have been so clear, so unambiguous, so sharp in his critique? Soon I realized that the problem was not with Tolstoy. It was with my assumptions about history and historical change. Deep down, I was assuming that we, as the critical thinkers of the tw late 20th and early 21st century, were more radical in our views on militarism and military service than our predecessors uh, from the previous century. The more I read about militarism, the more problematic this assumption became. 20th century has been a century of war and destruction. It has also been a century of militarized nationalisms defining the order of our lives. 
nationalism and militarism have strongly reinforced each other and have together made it very difficult to remember and appreciate Tolstoy's remarks on military service. After all, serving in the military, whether as part of a compulsory system or as a volunteer, is the most valued citizenship practice. Who can talk against those men and women who bravely put their lives at risk for all of us? We can only be grateful. Yet, as Elaine Scarry, critic Elaine Scarry, reminds us, the most fundamental activity in war is killing. In the words of Tim Goodrich, who spoke yesterday, a soldier's foremost job is to kill. Therefore, those men and women whom we are asked to be grateful to are not dying for us, they're killing for us in our name, with our direct or indirect support. According to historian Alfred Wachts, if the members of a whole nation are to be made soldiers, they must be filled with a military spirit in time of peace. And he wrote this in the 1930s. It seems as though nation states initially had two main tools to create citizens with a military spirit, universal compulsory military service, and universal compulsory education. These were the two institutions through which the state had direct contact with its citizens. And in the early years of nation state formation, and especially during times of war, there was a close link in the way these two institutions were perceived. The military was seen as a school, in Eugene Weber's term, terms, the school of the fatherland, and the schools were given a nationalizing and militarizing role. During and after World War I, there were fierce debates about militarism and education in the United States and Britain. Numerous reports, articles, books published on this issue. Educator and philosopher John Dewey, for instance, was vocal in his critique of military training in schools. Quote, military training in schools cannot be defended on the ground of physical training. Its real purpose is to create a state of mind which is favorable to militarism and to war. Now that war has been outlawed by ag agreement among the nations, it ought to be recognized that it's criminal to produce in the young emotional habits that are favorable to war. In Britain, John Langdon Davies wrote a book titled Militarism and Education, um, and argued that schools were being configured as the thresholds of conscription. He urged the public to be aware of the insidious advance of industrial and military conscription and suggested that they must cease to educate for war and to inculcate the doctrine of force. So let us ask ourselves, a century into these debates, has this marriage of nationalism and militarism through such practices as military service and national education cease to exist in the national and global order of things? If not, have we paid enough attention to them as scholars and activists? Or have the sciences and the social sciences, as well as our oppositional political struggles, been complicit in the normalization and invisibilization of the everyday forms of militarism? If you do a sort search on the internet or through your libraries on books that have militarism in their title, you would be surprised, or perhaps not, to find that quite a few of your major resources will be books from the first part of this century. Despite the critical thinking, at least in academia, on nationalism since the 1980s, there are still very few works that discuss militarism apart from the obvious militarism of Japan and Germany in World War II. For some reason, militarism as a concept has been absent from our critical vocabulary. Does this mean that it was absent from our lives? Or have we, as Issa Shiji, Shiji's paper uh, suggested on the first day, been embedded in military structures and militarized language as intellectuals as well? In the past years, as I was studying militarism in Turkey, one of the things I looked at in the context of the militarization of education has been a high school course on national security. Every single Turkish person you have met who is a high school graduate has been educated uh, at least for one year uh, on military issues as part of a curriculum 
and textbook developed by the military. The teachers of this course are military officers uh, in uniform, sometimes uh, retired. As I was doing ethnographic research on this course, my interest was met by surprise by many of the people around me, many of those I interviewed or just talked to. Almost everyone suggested that this course was not important at all. Um, it was an easy course, which didn't mean anything to the students. Many remembered that the students often made fun of this course and its teacher. The suggestion that the course might have had an impact on us in any way was absurd. No one takes this course seriously, why are you? was the most common response I received as I was doing this research. I ultimately concluded that these responses themselves were the utmost expression of the widespread nature of militarization in Turkey. The fact that all high school students were educated in military affairs by a military officer for a whole year was something to simply make fun of. The presence of the military in civilian schools was so normalized that there was nothing to take seriously. We are here today discussing war. A horrific human tragedy has taken place, is taking place in Iraq. Even as someone who has been following this war pretty closely, I've been shocked and utterly disgusted at the testimonies pro provided at this tribunal. These crimes committed against the Iraqi people are crimes against all of us. We're all asking ourselves a very simple yet very difficult question. How has this been possible? I would like to suggest that in seeking this answer, we remember Tolstoy and many others who have taken similar positions and pay more attention to peacetime war preparations and peacetime militarization. I understand militarism to be an ideology that glorifies practices and norms associated with militaries, the military uh, institution. Fundamental here is, of course, the normalization of violence, the use of violence. Military thinking and practice rests on the use of violence and makes everything else unimaginable. It is unrealistic, we're often told, to imagine nonviolent solutions to serious international conflicts. Nonviolence may be the ideal, but we all have to be realists and bite the bullet, so to speak. Very successful acts of nonviolent opposition to colonialism and racism, such as the Gandhian resistance, which resulted in the independence of India, uh, or the African American struggle for civil rights, which resulted in the desegregation of the United States, are presented as, as exceptions to the rule that violence is necessary to initiate social and political change. It is this argument about the inevitability of violence that militarizes our notion of resistance, our notion of opposition, our politics in general, oftentimes even in the anti-war movement. It's very significant in this sense that one member of the jury of conscience in this tribunal is a conscientious objector. Mehmet Tarhan is not against the Turkish military. He's against all militaries. Most importantly, he's against the very institution of military service, which even in the absence of war, perhaps more effectively then, militarizes our minds, our bodies, our relationships with each other, and our own self-understanding. As we hold this world tribunal at the turn of the 21st century, what do we have to say about our embeddedness in the prevailing discourses of militarism, in the subtle processes of militarization, and in the normalization of violence in both hegemonic and oppositional politics? What would Mehmet Tarhan say if he were here today with us instead of being detained in a military prison for persistent insubordination? Um, what does his insubordination tell us about our subordination? I'm personally saddened by our lack of attention to the militarization of the Iraqi resistance and the crimes committed by armed resistors against civilian Iraqis. Are we once again suggesting that there is no other way? And whose language does this mimic? This session is about the global security environment and future alternatives. Having talked about the urgent need I perceive in taking militarism and processes of militarization seriously as a way of understanding global insecurities, I would now like to concentrate on the issue of alternatives 
and point to a very creative form of political action carried by anti-militarists in Turkey in the past two years, Mehmet Tarhan being one of them. I want us to join their tour of militarist sites for a few minutes and reflect on similar sites in our own neighborhoods, in our own lives. On May 15, 2004, the International Day for, of Conscientious Objection, militarists, as in tourism, militarists gathered in Istanbul and started their day-long tour of selected militarist sites. In the Haidar Pasha train station, where one often witnesses the farewell ceremonies of young men going to their military unit, anti-militarists greeted the conscientious objectors arriving on the train, throwing one of them up in the air, shouting, our objector is the greatest objector. The next stop was the Gülhani Military Hospital. A case of apples were to be presented to the soldiers defending the hospital. Uh, they would be asked to separate the good apples from the rotten ones, as they were experts in this procedure. This did not happen because the group could not get close to the hospital, but instead they left the apples in a park nearby and asked the soldiers to come and get them. Why was this site important? The brochure of the Militarism Festival, actually this is the second one, I couldn't find the first one. Uh, the brochure of the Militarism Festival announced the Gülhane Military Hospital as the only state-sponsored institutional gay porn archive in Turkey. This was due to a widespread procedure whereby those men who declare themselves to be gay are, are asked to present photographs or videos that show them in a homosexual relationship. These photographs are meant to qualify them for the rotten or unfit report that they um, uh, would be given. This was part of Mehmet Tarhan's objection. He refused to get this report, saying that this procedure was a proof of the rottenness of the military system itself, not of him as a gay man. The militarism festival continued with a stop at a corporation, the Neural Holding, that produces weapons besides many other products for civilian consumption. Nobody is even aware that they produce weapons. The group read a declaration in front of this corporation and placed an order, or tried to, for broken rifles. The next site was a military recruitment office in Besiktas. After a very loud concert of anti-militarized songs, that is, songs whose lyrics were changed uh, into anti-militarist messages, in front of the recruitment office, the militarists proceeded to Taksim, where the new objectors, among them three women, read their ob uh, objection declarations. In May 2005, a year later, militarists were this time in Izmir, making visible the military symbols and sites of this beautiful Aegean city. Attended by a Greek conscientious objector, this tour covered a castle, a NATO base, a militarist statue, the central office of a company, Tukash, owned by the big military corporation, OYAK, and the military port facility. The final stop um, was the cultural heart of the city, Kıbrıs Şehitleri Caddesi, the Cyprus Martyrs Street. The street was in a neighborhood called Al Sanjak, literally red military flag, which we approached by dri driving on the Talat Pasha Boulevard, Talat Pasha being the main architect of the Armenian deportation law of 1915 passing the veteran primary school. As the brochure of the second militarism festival suggested, militarism was in every aspect of our lives. The tour ended with a non-militarist, non-violent, yet very loud walk, I won't call it march, along the Cyprus Martyrs Street, where the group shouted over and over again, we will not kill, we will not die, we will not be anyone's soldiers. Before this walk, 11 people, four of them women, read their conscientious objection declarations. Why were women refusing? Many people who witnessed this event asked. After all, military service is only obligatory for men. To answer this question, I will refer to a very revealing story that was published in the 1930s in a major Turkish monthly. In the story, Husman, a young peasant from Bergama, close to Izmir, is spending his last day in the barracks. He's very excited that it's his last day, not because he's leaving the military, but because he will be able to put to use all these things that he's learned in the military. 
he starts daydreaming. Quote, After he's back in the village and has his wedding, he will tell Kezban, his wife-to-be, all about the things he learned in military service. When Husman says it all to Kezban, she will be dumbfounded. The fascination of his wife will make Husman proud. He will first teach Kezban how to identify herself in the military way. When he calls Kezban, Kezban will run to him like a soldier, stand in front of Husman, and after giving the official greeting, she will say, Ali's daughter Kezban, yes sir, and will wait for his orders. End of quote. Such was the daydream of a young peasant man, as it was narrated in this short story in 1933. In this story, participation in the military is linked directly to masculinity, where military knowledge is power over women. Husman may have been a private accepting orders in the military, or a slave in Tolstoy's terms, but he is granted the unconditional position of the commander at home with the position of the slave designated for his wife. Like the Israeli women who have run a campaign called Women Refuse, and we are very fortunate to have one of the initiators of this campaign, Rela Mazali, here with us today, the women objectors in Turkey point to the crucial role that women play in normalizing and reproducing militarism in our contemporary societies. They point to the intricate links between militarism, sexism, as well as heterosexism, and challenge everyone to recognize those links. Mehmet Tarhan does the same. To repeat my earlier question, what would Mehmet Tarhan say if he were here with us? And this picture, by the way, was taken at the Global Day of Action against the Iraq War on March 19th, I believe. Um, I had no idea I'd be using this picture for this occasion. What would Mehmet Tarhan say if he were here with us instead of being detained in a military uh, prison for persistent insubordination? What does his insubordination tell us about our subordination, our embeddedness in reproducing militarized politics, militarized lives, and a militarized world order? Amy Bartholomew was suggesting earlier that we need to re-theorize empire. I would like to insist that we re-theorize militarism as well, and do this with feminist curiosity, to borrow Cynthia Enloe's beautiful formulation. This re-theorizing is necessary if we want to understand how Tolstoy can be more clear and more radical than most of us a century later. I want to finish with an anonymous anti-militarist statement. Imagine that there is a war and no one is going. Can we? Thank you. Women, when they are sleeping at night, wear pajamas or long dresses because they are afraid of dying naked if ever they are shot or bombed in their houses while they are sleeping. They don't want to be seen in an unseemly manner if they are dead. Another fact is that all of the family members are now sleeping in a single room. Girls, boys sleep in the same room, and the reason for this is the impulse of fear. There are many examples to this, so uh, we can see how change is coming about in these relations as well, and there's no solution to this at all presently. Those who are running this uh, military and psychological warfare want to achieve a name that we are very well aware of. Uh, they are violating seriously men's and women's rights. So when you look at the scandals in Abu Ghraib, uh, are, they are the most uh, dissipated uh, uh, scenes that you can witness. I would like to ask the question that most of you have already asked. Why are... Uh, Detained women left naked. Why are they made to walk naked before other detained male prisoners? And why are men, naked men, uh, 
made to go into cages where naked women are kept under detention. We have documented all this. There is an expression used by the president of the Union of Physicians when the Americans carried out this torture. They documented it with their own photos. And uh, today, Iraqi women are trying to find security for themselves uh, in their families, in their tribes, uh, and not by resorting to help from the UN or other security organizations at the international level. We also need to look at the economic security of the family. This is non-existent as well. Not only are not women in security gender-wise, but they no longer have economic security either. And I can give you figures of unemployment, which have been produced by an international organization. There is 72% of unemployment, and for women, this is around 90%. Yeah. 